Senator Paul Strauss, attorney and shadow senator, seat two of the District of Columbia, superdelegate in 2008. PaulStrauss.org, his website, is on the line with us. Uh, uh, Mr. Strauss, welcome to the program. Senator Strauss, welcome to the program. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be with you. Thanks for joining us. What is a shadow senator? Well, I'm elected by the residents of Washington, D.C., who can vote for me, but when I go to the Senate, I can't return the favor and cast a vote on their behalf when I go to the Senate floor. So, like Eleanor Holmes Norton in the House of Representatives? It is, but at least Delegate Norton has certain speaking privileges, uh, but she can't vote. In the Senate, the right to speak is paramount, so uh, a non-voting but speaking senator could filibuster and quickly get what they wanted. It works a little differently, but you're, you're not far off. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, I, you know, I live here in D.C., although I've only lived here a short while, and um, I'm still kind of learning my way around. Um, how, how is it that all this time, I mean, Washington, D.C. has a population that is larger than Wyoming, it's larger than Vermont, it's larger than probably four or five states. Uh, how is it that we, you know, and I, and I know in the beginning, you know, the founders had this idea that, you know, they'd create this district of the goddess. America should have a goddess. They'd call her Columbia. She's been on our coins forever. You know, she was on the early flags and things and everything else. And hail liberty. She's out in the New York Harbor. And, uh, but, uh, and, and that the people who worked in the district of the goddess would be so committed to, to God's work or to a, to a sacred work, the sacred work of democracy. They didn't call it God's work. That, 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 they, that they wouldn't even be allowed to vote. They would be so above all that. And, you know, it was a nice, idealistic uh, notion in 1770 or 1787, but um, now we've got uh, people who represent, you know, who live in a city that is larger than most states or some states yep. who have no representation in Congress. How go the efforts to change that? Well, the Democratic Party has some language in the platform supporting equal rights, but we're a little disappointed that they didn't come out for full statehood. Uh, that struggle is an ongoing one, and it's a difficult one. You know, our population may be larger than many states, but it tends to be blacker than many states. It tends to be bluer than many states. So if we had a population that looked, for example, more like Wyoming or Vermont, it may not be as controversial an issue. But if you look at the parts of the United States where the majority of the population is non-white, D.C., the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, all of those seem to lack equal rights. And I don't think that's much of a coincidence. Yeah, I, I suspect you're right. And um, as that demographic shift is occurring in the United States and as the white majority is diminishing, do you think that that, that demographic shift is going to be the thing that's going to drive the possibility of statehood for D.C.? Although D.C. is experiencing its own gentrification sort of demographic shift. I believe D.C. this year is becoming more than 50 percent white, or did I, did I read that wrong? Well, young people are moving back to cities because they're great places to live. Nobody wants to artificially live out in the suburbs just so their kids have to go to segregated schools anymore, like the old days. Yeah. So cities are coming back, you're experiencing a resurgence, and the district is attracting all kinds of people, black, white, Latino, uh, the population is changing. Yeah, and, and, and that's a, you know, presumably a good thing, I suppose. Um, what, what do you see as the big issues before the Democratic National Convention today? Well, obviously, we in the district have our issues with Democrats and Republicans on statehood, uh, but the Republicans have come out against it. So we, <coughs> we didn't come here to fight with uh, Democrats. We want to work with them to win in November. President Obama has been historically a supporter of statehood. There have been a lot of progressive causes he supported that he hasn't been able to get to, but we're hoping that in the second term we will. But tonight, the focus is going to be on getting our message out, moving forward, not going back to the policies from four years and before, and compared to what Mr. Romney's vision is, not going back to the failed policies of the 1950s and 40s that uh, are going to take this country back in a direction we don't want it to go. Yeah, well, he really wants to revive Reaganomics and Bushonomics, and, and uh, that didn't work out so well. It killed well, off some the of his class. deregulation ideas are more akin to the days of Herbert Hoover, even. So yeah. we, we have to really preserve the work that we've done. Obviously, we haven't accomplished everything that we as Democrats had hoped we would for the country, but there are a lot of accomplishments that we're not doing as good a job about talking about. So hopefully... For example? Can, well, um, we passed health care for all Americans. We have pay equity. We have ended 
the war in Iraq and brought those troops home. We're winding down the war in Afghanistan, we hope. We have a lot of accomplishments. We still have a lot of work to do. But moving forward isn't always easy. We have to make sure that we keep this country on the track that it's going and that we don't go back to letting Wall Street run unregulated again. That we don't allow the voter suppression efforts to keep minorities and African Americans and others who are trying to participate in the democratic process from doing that. And hopefully one day we're going to reintegrate the nation's capital actually into the nation and give the American citizens who live there, who fight for their country, who pay federal taxes, the same rights as their neighbors in the other states. Yeah, it seems like a reasonable thing. It just seems like a, you know, it's, it's so bizarre that uh, I've moved to the city where I have lost my representation, uh, or at least my vote, uh, or the vote of representation in both the House and the Senate. It's, it's, it's totally bizarre. Are there, uh, you know, most states send two senators. Do you have a colleague? I do. His name is Michael Brown. He is uh, the so-called junior senator. I have been, uh, Reverend Jackson is my more famous predecessor. He was the first D.C. shadow senator. But shadow senators aren't actually a District of Columbia invention. The territory that became Tennessee is recently, uh, as the territory of Alaska, all elected shadow senators as part of their bids for statehood. So we are following in a long and American tradition. And I actually wanted to, if it's all right, just correct you. Uh, when the District of Columbia was created from 1790 to 1801, D.C. residents had voting representation in Congress. Hmm. It was actually the Congress themselves, by an act of legislation, that took away our federal voting rights in 1801. During so, the Jefferson administration. Congress took it away. Congress can bring it back. And that's what statehood is about. It's actually true to the vision of the framers. As a fellow D.C. resident, you know that there is a neighborhood, there are areas that are exclusively federal. We call it the National Capital Service Area. Right. Uh, but you know instinctively whether you're in federal Washington or the residential district of Columbia. So if you're in the Southwest Waterfront or Tenleytown or Anacostia, you're in the district of Columbia. If you're on the National Mall on Capitol Hill or the White House, you're in that federal enclave. Statehood isn't about taking away federal control of the federal district. It's about bringing self-determination to the non-federal parts of the District of Columbia, where more people live, as you pointed out, than the citizens of many, many states. Yeah, yeah, I actually live down on the waterfront. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, spot on. Does the, the rest of the Senate recognize your shadow senator status, or uh, you know, do you show up for Senate sessions, things like that? Is there a place I for do. you there? I do. They give me certain courtesies. Uh, they don't give me the rights and privileges that I deserve as somebody who represents an American citizen like yourself. Uh, there are Democrats that are friendlier than others. There are Republicans that are friendlier than others. Uh, but what we need to do is change the structural relationship so that D.C. gets full statehood. We've experimented with various incremental measures. You know, obviously we get to vote in the Electoral College. Uh, we're here at the DNC with an equal delegation compared based on our population. Uh, but when it comes to the important rights and privileges, we still don't have that, and that's what we're pushing for. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and good luck with that. Has there, when was the last time serious legislation was introduced for statehood for DC, well, or has have, it ever been? We have serious legislation that's been introduced. The problem is, is that we can't even get this Congress and this Senate to pass legislation, pass a budget uh, that deals with the issues of our nation. It's tough to get anything dealing with just one particular jurisdiction, even when it deals with so many fundamental rights. Yeah. The obstructionist agenda in the House of Representatives has stopped meaningful efforts on a lot of issues, including D.C. State. Yeah, you're right. And and not to mention the uh, the filibuster obstructions in the Senate over the last three, three and a half years. Uh, Senator Paul Strauss, shadow senator for C2 of the District of Columbia and a superdelegate in 2008. PaulStrauss.org, the website. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. It's been great to be with you. Nice to meet you.